Well, hello, let's get started, everybody. I'm Alexander Lex, I'll be your instructor for this class. Uh, I'm an associate professor of computer science. I've taught this class many times. It's my favorite class to teach because it's exactly my research area. Uh, so I'm very excited for this semester. Um, before we get started, um, I just want to get a sense of the room. Like, who here is an undergraduate? Raise your hands. OK, we have like about a third. Who is like a master student? Yeah, so it looks like the other third, maybe a little more. And PhD students, great. PhD students are further back, so <laughs> that's an interesting observation. Uh, who is here for their first semester ever? Okay, there's not too many, but welcome to you especially. I'm excited to have you here. Um, and so in this class, we'll be talking about data visualization, visualization for data science. Um, we call it also traditionally information visualization. And so you've maybe taken another visualization class, like the visualization for scientific data, which is about all about um, spatial data. This class here is mostly about abstract data, but I'll give you this introduction today and over the next few lectures. So um, I like to start basically any talk I give about visualization with this quote. This is from Richard Hamming, a famous computer scientist. Um, and he said, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. He was thinking about like, if I run a weather simulation uh, on a supercomputer or something like that, right? I want to learn something about it. I don't care about exactly the numbers. I care about the insights that I, that I can derive and not some kind of numerical representation of them. And some smart computer scientists that work in visualization have kind of slightly modified this quote to say the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. Again, doesn't sound particularly difficult because what you really want to do when you do data visualization, you want to communicate something about the data or you want to make something discoverable in the data. But then unfortunately, sometimes we see terrible visualizations in the real world. So here is like a data set and I'll show you a terrible visualization about it later. These are five different plant species. They're all important plants for food supply. They all have fancy Latin names and scientists might want to study what is their genetic relationship between those plants, right? And so one way to look at this is to study um, how many genes are shared between them. And here I have a figure that was actually published in probably the most famous journals of them all in nature. Um, and this was the banana genome. And this was kind of the paper that for the first time discussed the banana genome and it had this figure in it. And I was really upset because this is a terrible visualization. So maybe not very smart in terms of pedagogy that I show you. The first visualization I'm showing you is actually a terrible visualization. But why is this a bad visualization, right? What it's supposed to be showing you is to show you the proportions of like how many genes are shared between the different plants. But you can actually tell that, right? Do you know how many uh, genes are shared between, let's say, just the banana and uh, whatever sorghum? You, you don't, right? It's really hard to decipher. So you would have to dig in. So for up here, you have like a tiny segment that corresponds to 1,151 shared genes. So that's kind of like a big deal, right? 1,000 genes shared between 
these particular species that intersect here. Right next to it, you have one of equal prominence with only 40 shear genes. So clearly not a great visualization. Correspondingly, you have like a gigantic segment down here um, and that only contains 105 shear genes. So this is not the kind of visualization we want to create. We want to create insightful visualizations. And I'll give you specific examples of how to do this better in the lecture on set visualization. But what is visualization about? If you look up a dictionary definition of visualization, you would get uh, the formation of mental and visual images, right? And so if you, if you hear like visual self, if you visualize yourself in an ice cave, this is kind of what this dictionary definition means, but it's not what I usually mean uh, with this definition. The act or process of interpreting in visual terms or putting into visible form. So yeah, this is like the general purpose dictionary definition. But if you look at the computer science textbook, what would be the definition for visualization there? Visualization is the process that transforms abstract data into interactive graphical representations for the purpose of exploration, confirmation, or presentation. So that's like a little bit more clunky uh, than the previous uh, definition, but it contains a few interesting things. So it's about the process that transforms data into something, right? So if we take data, it's all about data, data that we've collected in some form. Um, and then we create a graphical representation. But this isn't the charting class, right? Like, I'm not going to teach you how to, let's use, let's say, use Excel to create a static visualization. We'll be looking at, like, how we can create interactive visualizations. Because interactive visualizations have many advantages. They're richer. They allow you to manage scale and so on. And then this definition also contains these three purposes, this exploration, confirmation, or presentation. If you're like not a scientist, you might have encountered or you might encounter visualization mostly for presentation. So I've, I've been amazed over the last 10 years what the various news outlets like the Washington Post, the Financial Times or the New York Times have created in terms of rich interactive visual content, right? You've all seen like hundreds of COVID visualizations, I'm sure. Um, and so this is all presentation. Somebody has thought about what to show to you um, and then presents this to you. And the other spectrum is, let's suppose you're like a scientist and you have a data set that you collected, but you don't know what is in there. You might have a hypothesis, but you want to explore the data set. And so this is kind of like the spectrum that we want to cover in visualization. And many of the examples that I'll be showing are actually from presentation because those are the ones that are easy to show, right? Because I can pick public news sources uh, to, share, to share them with you. We can discuss them. The exploration piece is a little bit harder to come by. And so we'll be kind of like focusing slightly on presentation, but we'll be trying to cover also exploration. So um, what I think about good data visualization, I'm thinking about making data accessible to humans. It's also about combining the strengths of humans and computers. So for example, visualization has always been like interactive visualization has always been like um, in this kind of dialogue with algorithms or with machine learning algorithms or with AI. So like we have algorithms that produce some recommendations. We use clustering to like create a sorting or some kind of like ordering and then a heat map so that we can learn something about it. So we kind of like use the human perceptual capabilities and of course our ability to act upon what we learn, um, but we combine them with the strengths of the computer and interactive data visualization. And visualization is about insight. A good graphic should make you smarter. It should teach you something, right? It should like allow you to learn something about the data. And as I already mentioned, communication is essential. You not only want to become smarter yourself when you create a visualization, you also want to make somebody else um, like understand what is going on in your data. So Stu Card, like a famous uh, this uh, professor, he said, visualization is really about external cognition. That is how resources outside the mind can be used to boost the cognitive capabilities of the mind. And that may be a little bit hard to parse, but what he means is, Visualization is kind of like a medium for us to put something down so that, we have, so that we don't have to keep everything in memory. So think about like a scatter plot that shows you some math. Um, it would be really hard to read the, the data um, and just like mentally try to kind of understand where these points are placed, right? If you plot this on a chart, it is this external uh, thing that you can look at and that you can understand. So it's very much like note taking, for example, that helps you, right? You sketch, you visualize to understand the data, and therefore it's kind of like external cognition trying to help you. So um, I, I already talked a little bit about, visual, about communication, but I want to kind of like um, harp on this a little bit more. 
So why do we want to visualize? It's, it's really like to inform humans. Uh, it's about communication. The target of visualization is in 99.9%, .9 it's a human, right? There are some weird use cases where actually a computer might, might read your visualizations, but most of the time you're designing for humans. And it's most interesting to use visualization when questions are not well-defined, right? Like if you just want to know a single fact from a data set, for example, who is the fastest runner in the times that I recorded in the spreadsheet, you don't need data visualization for that, right? You can run an expression, or if you want to ask like, what's the average speed that people are driving on I-15 when they go to Ikea, you also don't need visualization. You can just compute that answer. But most of the time, the questions that we really are interested in aren't that well-defined. So we have kind of some fuzzy notion that this data set could tell us something. Um, and then we can use data visualization to explore what goes in. So for example, questions that you could ask is like, what is the structure of a terrorist network? Or what, uh, what particular, what track could help a specific patient with a certain disease, right? These are the kinds of fuzzy questions that uh, exploration for visualization is really great at. And so we have these purposes here, like we have, on the one hand, we have uh, we have kind of like open exploration, and you would use tools that are designed explicitly for experts. Like this, what I'm showing here on the left, this is like a cancer subtype analysis tool that I built together with colleagues like almost 10 years ago. And on the right, you have a chart that was very particularly created to tell you one single message. And this was a chart that the Obama administration published. And they were saying essentially, um, under the Bush administration, uh, there were lots of jobs lost. And this is kind of like the red bars that look downhill. And then suddenly Obama took over and everything went uphill, right? So there's a lot of framing here. Like they, they picked a very particular time frame to make this very kind of like interesting uh, thing here. And we'll talk about like, you know, what gets into decision-making? Why did they not show maybe a couple of years uh, of the Bush presidency or the couple of months where the chart was actually showing in the right direction for, for uh, if you, from the his perspective, or why did they not show anything subsequently there? What are the kinds here? The Republican red is much darker than it usually is, right? So like there's lots of subtleties going on in this chart. Um, and we might be talking about this in a little bit more, maybe for this chart, but for, for charts like this. This is a chart that I really like. Um, this is about communication. Um, like I guess not the like not everybody here cares about American football. I'm not American either, so I didn't. Uh, grow up with American football, but this visualization is about uh, the uh, Peyton Manning's uh, record uh, all-time um, touchdown passing, right? And so this is like a visualization by the New York Times where they have kind of made a very, like a, they have a data set, but they've made a lot of curated decisions. So what they're showing you is like, when were people, when did they start their careers? How long did their careers last? And what was their trajectory with respect to this particular goal? Um, touchdown passes, right? Uh, and what you can see here, like the slope tells you how effective a quarterback back is, and the length of the line, or basically the like uh, the height, or the and in this case actually distance on the on the x-axis tells you how long they were active, um, and how far they are on the top. It tells you uh, whether they were uh, whether like whether they were good at what they were doing. And you can see that Peyton Manning has like is, is at the very top here. Um, and the other thing that they're doing is they're using color very subtly, but very effectively to visualize the players that could potentially, that are still active and that could potentially break this record. And so um, this is also an interactive visualization from the New York Times. Um, by the way, when I share the slides, they will all have these links um, and then you can play later and play with these visualizations yourself. And so you can actually, you see there's like some of these players are highlighted, but uh, like some of them, you can just reveal when you hover over it. So it's kind of like this, this dual thing of like, an, some author has made some decisions on who are the key people to highlight, but you can still dig in and find more information about everybody else here. Um, what's that? Uh, it means the number of touchdown passes that, that this person made in their career. Uh, okay. And so in contrast to this, like cancer subtype exploration is like a very complicated thing. Here I'm showing some kind of like clustering based on some machine learning algorithms. I'm showing how this correlates with like a particular mutant status of a known uh, oncogene EGFR. And then I'm showing how this impacts survival, right? These couple of myoplots show you that like, this is bone brain cancer. So this is pretty bad outcomes usually. 
Um, and so we can look at, are these survival curves the same for all of these different subtypes? And it turns out they're not, right? And we can drill in and we can look at, um, it looks like if you have some kind of amplification, which are these lower curves here of this particular gene. So if you have multiple copies of that gene, it looks like your chances of survival are much lower than if you have the same cancer, but don't have that particular uh, genetic variation. So as I said before, sometimes we can answer um, specific questions just like textually, um, but we, we talk about graphics here and why are graphics really interesting here? First graphics have like an amazing bandwidth, right? Like we can see in parallel, like I can see basically all of you, but I wouldn't understand if you all talk at the same time, right? Um, I can't read 10 things at the same time, but I can see many things at the same time. Of course, this isn't absolute. We'll talk about the perceptual system that in reality, our, our vision is much more constructed than it is actually like appears to us. Um, but generally the, the visual system has the highest bandwidth of all of our senses. And, and figures are also richer. They provide more with less clutter and in less space than the alternatives. They provide what's called the gestalt effect. Uh, they give an overview and they make structure visible. Um, figures are accessible, right? It's easier to read a figure than to understand some statistics or to read some complicated text. They're easier to understand. They're faster to the graphs. They're more comprehensible. So they're more memorable, more fun, and they're less formal. They're also engaging, right? So if you have a good figure in an article, in a blog post, or anything like that, um, you can use the, uh, the, um, that will actually drive readership that will like uh, let people pick your article to read. So um, I want to give you an example of what I mean by this. Uh, this is an article like the New Yorker is this magazine that publishes actually no data journalism, right? They, they do long form reporting and it's a great magazine, um, but sometimes that's really hard. And so they hear they were reporting about the uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And so they were describing a map and I want to read this uh, to you. Campanella then switched to an identically constructed map, only this time based on the 2010 census data and in bits and pieces on the screen, there was a simple and arresting picture of what Katrina meant. In the neighborhoods that were once the dense black, many of the little squares had thinned and turned gray. The sharp lines that once separated the teapot from Central City were now blurry. The white areas of the city were pushing north into the vacuum left by the exodus. The bywater was graying as it gentrified still further. And so on. And so what do you, what do you see here is like, this is like a fairly complicated description of a visualization. And then I asked myself, well, why not just show a picture, right? Uh, like you can immediately grasp the picture. This isn't actually this, exactly the same picture, which I couldn't find, but this is the Katrina diaspora. Where are the people that were uh, kind of like pushed out of New Orleans by Katrina, where they moved, right? And we see this cluster around New Orleans, but we also see that the population of New Orleans dispersed all over uh, the United States. And that would be really difficult to describe textu textually, but it's clearly evident in just like a second to all of you if I show you a map. So. Of course, visualization isn't the thing that solves every problem of data analysis, right? Like there's many, many things that you have to do, right? And there's many things that visualization isn't great at. So for example, there's well-defined questions on a well-defined data set that I already mentioned before, then you actually don't need visualization, right? Um, also, um, sometimes you don't, can't use visualization because you need, the human intervention isn't possible or necessary. So for example, if you need a decision in minimal time, then visualization isn't great, right? Because people have to think about it. They have to like bring all of this together. We're not like algorithmic decision makers. So if you wanted, for example, to do high frequency stock trading, clearly there's no place for a human in the loop, right? Um, so you, there's also no place for uh, a visualization to be shown. Or if you have like a, a plant that does some computer vision to recognize whether a bottle is broken, you don't want to visualize the bottles that are broken somehow, but you want to rather build an automated system to discard the bottles, right? So in these cases, you definitely don't want visualization. And then sometimes it's also impractical for humans to be involved. So like, it might be nice if you have your personal curator for your Netflix viewing, but generally like we use kind of recommendation systems for that, right? When you have to scale something out to many different people. So we use automated data products uh, for something like Netflix recommendations or shopping recommendations or Google search or anything like that. Um, and so I mentioned before this kind of like dialogue between humans and computers that is going on when we do data visualization. And so this here is kind of like a schematic uh, 
plot here of what computers are good at and what humans are good at. Um, and so humans is, are, of course, great at data storage. Like every picture you've ever taken is now backed up to the cloud and you have access to it at any time. You might not even remember that you were displaced 10 years ago, right? But the computer still remembers. Uh, numerical calculation, searching or finding, even some logic, computers tend to be really good at. Planning, diagnosis, prediction tends to be a little bit more in the human purview. But of course, we are always pushing the boundaries on these things. And then cognition, bringing in common knowledge and creativity are kind of like the domain of the human. And they will be for like the foreseeable future, no matter what kinds of progress we'll be making in AI, right? So this is really like where humans uh, bring something uh, to the table that computers can't do. And visualization really is about kind of like bringing those two things, bridging the best of both humans and computers. Of course, we could create visualizations by hand. And historically, like many of the charts that we'll be talking about were invented way before computers were ever created, right? So like anything from pie charts to maps to like more complicated things were created before, uh, or even like anatomical drawings were created before computers were in, uh, ever invented. But of course, doing something with a computer has many advantages. And this applies to uh, visualization just as well as to many other things. So for example, drawing something by hand is pretty difficult uh, or an illustrator. It might something be, sometimes be infeasible. Uh, it might be inflexible. So for example, if I have streaming data or if, my, if I want to apply my chart to another data set, right? Of course, I, I want to use a computer program to generate my chart instead of drawing it. And then some things a computer simply can't do, right? Like how would you draw an MRI scan, right? You clearly need a computer to do that. Um, and then interaction is also a great thing. Interaction allows us to drill down into the data. So here's like a picture that a student of mine did many years ago. And I just wanted to show like, it doesn't matter what this actually is, but it just you, you show some rich exploration capabilities, right? That are just not possible if you had a static visualization. And then, a key thing that becomes more and more important, especially for exploratory data analysis, is this integration with algorithms, integration with machine learning pipelines, and so on. Making visualization part of your data analysis pipeline um, is, is why computers are great for it. And of course, it's efficiency. We want to reuse charts. We want to uh, reuse methods for different data sets. We want to have high quality drawings right there that are precise, that's easy to do with the computer. And we want to use time. So, we can actually kind of time visualizations to reveal to be automatically revealed or to be revealed upon a certain action. For example, we have scrolly telling stories and so on, right? And so here's like an, an again a completely animated story that I show here because it's kind of like a hybrid between a video and a data visualization. Ariana Rivera is one of the most dominant closers in history. But what may be most remarkable is that he's done it by confounding hitters with mostly one pitch, the signature cutter. John Flaherty of the Yes Network faced Rivera as a hitter and also caught him when he played for the Yankees. From a hitter standpoint, he's out on the mound and it feels like he's not even putting any effort into it and the ball explodes on you. And from a catching standpoint, uh, he's the easiest guy ever to catch because he throws the ball right where you want. Rivera uses a seemingly effortless delivery, which he can flawlessly repeat pitch after pitch. His cutter is thrown very much like a fastball, but the pitch has significant lateral movement. He creates and adjusts this movement with the different pressure he puts on the ball with his fingers. The pitch's lateral movement keeps it off the bat's sweet spot, moving in on the hands of a left-handed batter and toward the end of the bat of a right. To a hitter, Rivera's cutter first appears like a straight fastball, making it hard to distinguish the two pitches during the first fractions of a second when the hitter must decide if often rely on reading a pitch's spin to determine what but Rivera's fastball and cutter have what appear to the hitter as the same spin. Many pitchers throw their cutters more like flies with their fingers pulling down on the side of the ball. This can create more downward and lateral movement than a cutter, but it also creates the signature spin of a slider, a spinning red dot, that the hitter can recognize and adjust to. With identical deliveries and spins on Rivera's pitches, hitters are at a loss to identify and then attack the pitch until it is too late, and the balls end up in very different locations. Here are the nearly 1,300 pitches that Rivera threw in 2009, each frozen at the point when the batter must make the swing decision. But with few clues to determine the pitch's ultimate location, the batter can be faced with guessing at these outcomes. <laughs> Here are the cutters to left-handers. 
Here are the cutters to right handers and fastballs to right handers. He throws almost no fastballs to left. As this map of his 2009 pitches shows, Rivera is remarkably adept at hitting the corners, keeping the ball away from the middle of the plate, the easiest spot for a batter to make good contact. Looking from this perspective, it's not surprising that the real hot spot is inside on the left. I think he can hit that spot with his eyes. Rivera's simple but effective formula has made him baseball's most dominant closer. Okay. Well, I think this is like a great um, piece of data storytelling. And then here's the, the canonical examples that people always show you shouldn't use statistics. This is what's called like a, a data set. We have actually four different data sets with two dimensions each, um, x and y. Uh, and each of these data sets here has like a like maybe like 10 data points. Um, and it's the interesting thing about this data set is that they statistically speaking, if you just run some simple st uh, descriptive statistics on them, they look extremely similar. They have the same mean in X and Y, they have the same variance in X and Y, they have the same X, Y correlation, and they also have the same linear regression. So if you just ran these algorithms to kind of like understand what's going on in these data sets, you might conclude that their data sets are basically maybe drawn from the same underlying distribution. But if you look closely, you might already know some weird stuff uh, going on here, but if you plot them, uh, you immediately see it, right? Um, so you see this kind of like in the first example here, you see this linear relationship with some noise, then you see some nonlinear strict relationship, then you see the effect of two different outliers, right? And so these are the things that kind of can really deceive you if you're uh, just not like looking at the data. And so in whenever you kind of like want to do statistics on data, it's also important that you first plot it so that you make sure that your data set is actually kosher. And this is actually, you can take this to the extreme. Uh, this is like a paper from Kai 2017, uh, which actually showed that you can kind of keep the mean, the standard deviation, and the correlation completely consistent over all of these different states and also the intermediate states, right? So I, like we're showing you many, many different patterns here, like complicated patterns that we as humans can easily perceive, but statistically they look the same, right? The point here is that this isn't, uh, that this isn't just like some particular well-constructed data set but you really have to look at your data. So the way I think about visualization is really, it's about human data interaction, right? It's like how humans best interface with data. And so let's talk a little bit about data. Um, like data, and I think that interestingly enough, um, like many of you, like some of you are here in a degree that's called the data science um, uh, undergraduate curriculum. Um, but many of you, like this class is also called visualization for data science. And so maybe we should talk a little bit about what data science is and what the role of visualization in data science is. And this is kind of like um, a graphic that I'll be building up here that's adapted from uh, uh, doing data science, a book by Kathy O'Neill and Rachel Shud. And so data science, the real world. We collect some data about a phenomenon that we're interested in in the real world. And then we do some data processing usually like raw data or data that we've collected has to be kind of like changed in some way. There might be some cleanup to do. Um, then uh, we do this data cleanup um, and then we go into exploratory data analysis. As I just showed, you, you really want to look at your data just to make sure everything is okay. Um, then you like build some, like some machine learning model or some model that does something that makes some prediction or that uh, makes some recommendation. Um, and then use this information uh, to kind of like communicate uh, results. You could either do this directly with the clean data that would be a kind of like data visualization without any kind of algorithms behind it, or you could use the output of a statistical model or for some fancy algorithm to create a visualization, then to communicate it to a human and the human can then make decisions. Of course, there's also this other way that I mentioned before, we could also just build a data product like a system uh, that then again influences the real world. Um, and so visualization actually plays an important role, of course, in this exploratory data analysis space here, but it actually plays um, a role of, and of course, also in the communication space here. Um, but it actually plays an increasingly important role in data processing and data cleanup. So for example, I've published a couple of papers on how we can use visualization to restructure data sets, specifically networks. 
Um, and there's plenty of tools out there and like large businesses that specialize on data cleaning, like human centered data cleaning. And then whenever you ask somebody, what is the most complicated thing or most time intensive thing in the data science process, they always say data processing and data cleaning, right? It's very, very rarely this kind of like fancy statistical modeling or machine learning, uh, uh, building machine learning algorithms. Um, and then you can also use visualization to debug machine learning algorithms, right? So we are like, there's many visualizations out there that attempt to visualize what's going on in the run or that try to kind of like make the results tangible. It's like human understanding of AI and explainable AI are big hot topics in the visualization community. So this plays a role in all of those different things. And there's like many different types of data. So here I'm showing you an example of personal data. This was all data more or less collected by my phone, right? As I was wearing it. Um, so you see like a map of the places that I've visited and you can see that it's like a Europe and US centric uh, where I've been. Or you can see like on a single day, I have location tracking on, on my phone, right? And you can see that I went from home, I went to work, I had to pick somebody up at the airport, I went for dinner somewhere in town. All of this is automatically tracked and you can actually get that information and you can build a visualization based on it. Or, or here on the right is like a um, Strava profile, like uh, a ride that I did, a mountain bike ride, the Wasatch Crest Trail. Um, and again, that's, that was locked, right? This is personal data. I can see was it faster, what was the speed, what was my heart rate and so on. So you have all of this personal data now available, mostly through our phones. But then of course, big data happens also and predominantly actually in big data in science and engineering. Uh, it really has to transform science and engineering, like cheap sensors and by that I mean anything, right? Like images, uh, um, like cameras that, that do imaging, um, they have changed everything. So for example, large physics experiments and observations, genome sequencing at like unprecedented scales, smart buildings, uh, smart cities and so on. All of this uh, collects data. So for example, you might, there's a company in Utah that's called Blins, Blinsky. Um, and you might not be aware of this, but they build profiles of how people move just by our phones. They, they kind of build fake hotspots in the city. Uh, and your phone track and just ask them, what is your like uh, SSID? Um, and by that, they kind of build movement profiles of people, right? And they do this at airports, they do this in all other places. Um, and so, um, we can like we will be talking about ethics of many of those things, um, but the fact is this data is being collected and this data can be analyzed and can be visualized. One controver uh, controversy that is happening in science is like what is good science? Is good science still hypothesis driven? So I have an idea, I collect data to like validate or invalidate my idea, and then I have a conclusion. Or is it also legitimate to simply mine large data sets for insights without having like a preconceived notions of what I will find. So that's like a difficult question to answer um, and, and time will tell. In genomics, um, like this here is like a hand, a hand sized sequencing machine, right? That you can put samples on it and you collect tons of data. Um, we can like reconstruct the phylogenetic for the tree of life, the phylogenetic tree uh, based on genomic sequences. We can, like we all have, you probably all have heard of services like 23andMe or ancestry.com, right? That can tell you, uh, who are you related with? And they can build these massive genealogies. And these have like lots of like, let's say civilian applications, but they also have lots of medical applications. So for example, I've worked on projects to study genetic factors of suicide uh, in, in families in Utah. Um, and then data of course has to be stored. And like one little tidbit about Utah specifically, the NSA has one of the largest data storage centers in Utah, uh, in Bluffdale actually. The estimates for storage capacity vary. Uh, the NPR article that I found estimates like that five zettabytes of data. And if zettabytes of data doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean much to me either. But essentially like there's a thousand megabytes uh, uh, is uh, one gigabyte and then a thousand gigabytes is one terabyte. A thousand terabytes is uh, one um, petabyte. A thousand petabytes is one zettabyte uh, exabyte and then a thousand exabytes is one zettabyte, right? So it's like gigantic. Uh, and all of this is being stored here in Utah in this NSA center. So this is a quote from Google's former chief economist. And he, he said, the ability to take data, to be able to understand, to visualize it, to communicate it, that's going to be a skill 
in the next decades because now we really do have essentially free and ubiquitous data. And so um, this is not a machine learning class. Um, and as I already mentioned, it's all about like the, how do humans interface, right? And so it's about human data interaction. And humans are kind of like great and awesome and our visual system is cool, but there's a lot of things that we have to be aware of. So um, I mentioned before that we have these human, these exemplar, these uh, exceptional capabilities like pattern discovery. We're really good at seeing clusters, at least in 2D. Uh, we're good at seeing outliers, we're good at seeing trends. But I think what makes us the most, like much better than any computer is and will ever be in the near future is that we bring in context, right? We have an understanding of the world and what the data means, how it was collected. And all of that is not really like general purpose knowledge isn't usually built into like a data product uh, at this time. And then of course, humans can take action. We can react to something, we can change something based on what we learn. But we have to design for humans and their limitations. And so like not everything that I can plot is actually a possible lead. Here are two examples of uh, network visualizations that are nonsensical, right? They, uh, they, I don't learn anything about the structure of the network. It's just overplotted. I, the only thing that is, okay, these networks are big. Uh, but that's basically it. So there's limits to what we can create uh, when we create visualizations. But there's also limits of what we can perceive. And so I want to show you this little research video from psychology. Um, and what you see here is there's like one person on the left, he is asking for direction. The older gentleman is, is, uh, is obliging and giving these directions. And now something happens. Uh, you're actually switching out the people. Uh, and the older guy is so immersed in the activity of explaining the directions, doesn't even notice that he's talking to a different person, right? Um, and so it's actually like, if you, if you look, like if you, if you think about it, like we sometimes like, you know, we perceive our environment, but we are very selective with our attention. Uh, we like, I unfortunately won't be able to remember every single face uh, after this one lecture here, even though I saw every one of you, I'll, I'll learn over the semester. Uh, but this is kind of like the limits of our cognition. That, and so we'll have like a dedicated lecture on looking at these limits of, connect, uh, of, uh, of human cognition, of human visual system and so on. And so now I wanna go, uh, do it like a, a little history of visualization. And this is gonna be short. I'm gonna start with cave painting, sorry. Um, but <laughs> uh, I think it's still useful to think about where we are coming from, right? Um, the, the things that make us smart that I mentioned earlier about like all visualization is like a tool for external cognition. And that's true also for drawings and for text, of course, right? And so we see these kind of like examples uh, of, of drawings and, uh, and they, they might have been had artistic value, but they might also have informative value, right? So I might have learned something from them. Um, they've used some kind of like notations for things like music, graphical notations, or kind of used uh, like some graphical notations for, uh, for mathematics, or we have used illustrations to make the point to kind of like enrich a story. Um, and then we like, these were like more of like, you know, artistic in, in a sense, but this here are actually super early examples of what I would call data visualizations, right? So we have a map of a town in Turkey from about 6,200 before Christ, or we have um, a map of the Mediterranean of uh, 550 BC. Um, these are like some early examples of where, where data visualization was happening. And I was like very impressed. I saw this in the museum last year. This is the uh, Tabula Pituingeriana, which is like a Roman road map. And they actually had all of the major uh, roads of the Roman empire on this like six meter, like 18 feet long map. Um, and like, this is like the, the, the what you see here, the, the picture is of like a 13th century copy, but supposedly this was like actually a map that was used in Roman times. And so there's a long and rich history, especially of maps, but like anatomical drawings, right? Like you have, drawings from Leonardo da Vinci that show anatomy that are really not easy for us to see otherwise, right? Like we don't actually wanna cut up people all the time, but we, it's still useful for us to understand how the body, the physiology works underneath of it. Um, and similarly, phases of the moon or plants be spent that we can't be seeing because we might be in a different place, right? This was how, how we learned and how we documented uh, before we had computers. And then here, this is like an interesting story um, this is the story of Edward Muybridge, and he was like a, 
a photographer, an avid photographer. And back in, this was in 1878, there was like a discussion and nobody really knew whether when a horse gallops, does do actually all of the four legs leave the ground immediately or is, is uh, our two feet always on the ground, right? And that wasn't clear. And so what he did, he set up like a, a big rig. He set up, in this case, it was 16 cameras and then wires that he ran across the track. And then when the horse ran through it, it triggered a camera and the camera took a photo. And then uh, these were the photos that you saw here, this here. And you can see very clearly in the second, third photo that uh, the legs of the horse are off the ground, right? So basically he was able to solve this, 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 this question that was partly discussed in society back then. And somebody has assembled this since it's a nice GIF and you see the, uh, like a video of this horse galloping. Side note, um, just uh, some, some uh, not visualization related really fact, Edward Muybridge actually killed his wife. Um, <laughs> and he was acquitted because she was having an affair and back then it was considered justifiable homicide. <laughs> so uh, this was all very concrete data. Uh, we can also like, and then there's more abstract data. For example, here, this diagram shows you uh, planetary movement, right? Like somebody has observed how the planets in the solar system are moving on the sky and the night sky. And they've kind of like documented this planetary movement. So they've kind of created a visualization of something that is not there, right? It's, it's, it's only like abstract information. And similarly, the wind maps that were, of course, super important for sailors to understand uh, which kind of like what, what roughly to expect if they wanted to do uh, transatlantic or uh, ocean journeys in general, wind maps um, also show you something that isn't visible, that isn't there, right? It's abstract data, abstract information. And then in the area of William Playfair, he's like a, who kind of like, used, maybe developed, but there's some dispute about this, but he used many of the charts that we now consider statistical charts, like area charts, line charts, bar charts. And so he made these charts to kind of like show uh, economic production, mostly of England and some of the other uh, countries in the, uh, around England. And then we have here an example of an early pie chart that shows us the proportion of um, like the Turkish Empire uh, still now as then is partially in Asia as it is in Europe. And this pie chart shows us the proportion of Turkey or the Turkish Empire back then uh, in Europe and of course the proportion in Asia. So this is like one of the earliest pie charts that we are aware of. And then if you... Okay, looks like. So um, a little bit hard to see, maybe now a little bit better to see these like uh, circular dots here. And that were the water pumps in the area. And so I have like highlighted a red one and the green one here. And what you can see is that the cholera cases cluster around this one water pump, right? So his theory was that this water well is causing cholera. And so he had the, the story goes, uh, he had the handle of that water pump removed and then helped to kind of like prevent further infections. This is the other chart that if you, if you have any kind of like passing interest in data visualization, you've probably seen this chart before. Um, let me hide this. Okay, you've seen this chart before and this shows you kind of like the Napoleon's March on Russia. Um, and this is like, some people have called this the greatest data visualization. Um, and what it shows you is um, the, the Napoleon's army started out somewhere in France. And here the thickness of the, 
of this brownish line or this brownish ribbon is the size of the army. And so then you see like he marched east, like rightwards um, on this map towards Moscow. Um, and you can see that the army kind of like split off a few times and then it kept shrinking. Um, and eventually they arrived in Moscow and they, they, they kind of like attempted to conquer Moscow. Um, and what's interesting, like the black ribbon now shows the retreat. Um, and what you see here is that there were barely any lives lost in the actual battle, but most of the lives lost were over the progression of just moving towards Moscow. Um, and on the retreat, you can see that there are these like temperatures really like this was in winter and temperatures really dropped. Um, and so he adds um, this, this, this line chart at the bottom that shows the temperatures at these certain events. Um, and people started like the soldiers in that army started to like freeze to death. Um, river crossings back then were treacherous, obviously, um, especially in the winter. And so here you can see, like, if you look very closely, you can see here around here that like half of this uh, of his army that was already pretty small, but half of the army perished on a river crossing without any but any influence of like an opponent or anything like that, right? Um, and so some people consider this to be one of the greatest maps ever made or the greatest data visualizations ever made. I think it's like a, definitely interesting to to see and to learn about. So I'm not gonna go into details for this, but this is more for you to explore. Um, this is like a website that has a chronology of some super early visualizations and that might be fun um, if you like this kind of like historical background here. Um, communication is of course, as I mentioned many times now, important in data visualization. Um, and what you see here is like the London subway map. This is like actually like, you know, it's, a, it's slightly complicated to read this chart. It's hard to read the labels. Um, and so you could kind of come up with a different design, a different layout, right? Um, so here is like a, um, uh, this is a Boston subway map. And here it's kind of focused to show you something else. It's focused to show you the time it takes to ride a particular subway line. So instead of like space, we're showing time here. And um, like, if you, if you know the Boston subway system at all, you know that the green line is terribly slow. Um, and so the green line appears super long here, right? Even though it's actually like the orange line and the red line are much longer than it. Um, and so you can kind of like switch out your perspectives uh, to communicate different aspects of a data set. Um, of course, like all of this, like I, I, I mentioned that we are all about um, visualization with computers. Um, and I think that there is like some stuff that happened here at Utah um, really was um, like groundbreaking. Like Ivan Sutherland was actually a faculty at, uh, at uh, Utah at some point, um, and here he's demoing like an early screen, an early interactive screen, and I'm gonna play this YouTube video for you. And I'm I'm sorry, this probably won't show up on a Zoom. I lost tap in there. I blew the pen through that. That called the computer stop drawing the line. But if you notice that bright dot will jump onto the line and it gets close to it. The dot in the center of the car will get close to it and jump over onto the track. So it's one of the units. It's much like a gravity field at the end point, and it's even a higher than this. It allows us to predict the point exactly on the line, or in this case, exactly the end point. This allows me to move my pen quite close. Isn't that amazing? The, <laughs> the lines move along. So that was kind of like, of course, back then, uh, crazy. Um, but I guess the most impressive demo of all times is um, by Douglas Engelbart and his team, um, the mother of all demos. And this is like a two hour video where, where they demoed anything from simultaneous editing of documents like Google Doc and video conferencing, the computer mouse. Um, 
and all of that in one single demo. And I'm just going to show you like a brief snapshot here. Alex, your Zoom is muted. Okay, is it better now? Somehow I muted my cell phone intentionally, sorry. Yes, this is working now. Okay, uh, any female names I should try? Karen. <laughs> Courtney? Courtney. So Courtney was super popular around like 80s to 90s. What's it? It's Vista. Vista. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Okay, a very uncommon name since like the, well, it was always very uncommon, right? It's like eight birth, birth per million. So yeah, you can play with this. The link is in the slide deck that I'll share later. Um, but just something fun to do. And then um, 
Also, Maybe I I'll skip this. This is a great uh, video of, of uh, Hans Rosling, but uh, he's like a great communicator. Um, watch that video later. I'll put a link to it, but I want to get to the logistics and not kind of lose out and tell you all about homeworks and exams and so on. So Alex, great. So your screen is not shared right now. Uh, okay. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, So, so let's talk about the team. Uh, who is um, the, the, the like? Who is the staff in this, this class? So, we have, uh, in addition to myself, the people that you will be interacting with a lot are, is our wonderful course staff, um, Taihan, Kiran, Pranav, and Tripti. Uh, they are all like uh, have been in this class before, or are senior PhD students. So they'll be helping you all out. They will be having office hours. Um, Taihan is online. Kiran is online. Pranav, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Pranav. So I did talk a little bit about me uh, already. Um, I, I'm an associate professor here. I just spent like my last year back home in Austria. Um, I had my sabbatical, which is like one of the nicest perks about faculty life that every seven years you get to take a year off and do something else. Um, before I came here, I was a postdoctoral fellow and a lecturer at Harvard. And my PhD is from Austria. And as you can see, I love to snowboard and ski and all of these kinds of things. Um, um, I run the visualization design lab um, here. Like it's a picture we just took in our first in-person group meeting since I got back from my sabbatical and since we got back from COVID. Uh, we are currently five PhD students and one full-time software engineer. Um, we kind of like fluctuate in size a little bit, especially if we have uh, like additional masters or undergraduate students. But if you're interested in our research, you can check out this, this website here. Um, we're part of the Ski Institute. Um, like I'm sure you're all familiar with the School of Computing, but the Ski Institute is kind of like a research institute that draws faculty from many different areas, including computer science. We specialize in scientific computing, biomedical computing, scientific information visualization, and image analysis. And so if you want to learn about ski, you can go to this website. I'll also jump over my research stuff because I will be talking about this enough. Anyways, when I talk about the lectures, just want to make sure that we have enough time for the formalities and maybe some questions. Okay, so like, what are the goals of this lecture? Uh, what you will learn is how to efficient, efficiently and effectively visualize data. Like one thing that we'll be spending a ton of time on is evaluating and, creating, cre uh, and critiquing visualization design. So most lectures will have like an in-class activity where I hand out some paper uh, with a visualization, maybe a link to an interactive visualization. And then you'll be spending some time in a small group to like think about this visualization and analyze it. And then we'll like do a classroom discussion where we all together kind of like analyze this visualization. And that's like a very common method that you might not be super familiar with if you're mostly taking traditional CS classes, for example, but in like any design oriented research, this kind of like critiquing is a very common approach. Uh, you will also learn to apply fundamental principles and techniques, and you will uh, learn to design visual data analysis solutions yourself. There's a technical component to this lecture. So you will actually learn to implement interactive data visualizations on the web. And that will help you develop also some web development skills. Like this is not a, not a major part of the course. I'll be teaching about eight lectures on, on technical aspects. What, how, what is JavaScript? How, what is D3? This is the library we'll be learning. And what is the DOM and this kind of stuff. Um, but of course, like your homeworks are going to be mostly uh, I, like using these technical tools. So it will be like you, you will be developing your own visualization and it will be all in code. It won't be any like graphical uh, library to, to create visualizations. And so we have these, these three components here in the course. We have theory, um, which is kind of like mostly communicated through me lecturing. We have design skills, which is mostly critiquing and doing like your designs on your own. And there's the codings where we have like labs, um, we have like readings, we have some self-study, we have office hours, and we also have some lectures that teach you coding skills. 
Um, so the components of this course is lectures this is what we're doing here. Um, I mentioned these design critiques already, um, and these will happen in breakout rooms. One thing that we'll be doing is um, these design critiques there on paper, um, and then after class, you hand you can hand in your critique, like your handwritten critique, uh, or you can upload it to Canvas. I'm not sure what we we'll exactly do. Like, you take a photo, upload it to Canvas, and then you'll get credit uh, for five of those, right? So this is kind of like your participation grade. If you're here and if you do the design critique and take a, a picture of it, upload it to Canvas, you get a point. This is like in total 5% of your grade. Um, then we will have labs. Um, these labs are going to be Monday evening, most likely. Uh, we'll announce a room. And these labs will be like not every week. There will be probably five or six of them in total. But they will be mostly introducing the homework. So a TA will be like sitting down and giving you some kind of like, you know, introduce the homework assignment and also give you some hints at what are the tools and techniques that you need to know to solve that particular homework. The homeworks are what helps you practice your development skills or like in the first, is, uh, in the first two examples actually also some design skills. And then the big thing in this class, and this is actually the majority of your grade, is the final project. And so you'll be forming a team and building all together one big visualization. Um, where you do all aspects of it. You do the planning, you do the design, you would like go through design iterations, you get feedback from us, you get feedback from your peers, and then in the end you build an interactive visualization tool. Um, Schedule-wise, lectures are Tuesdays and Thursdays, which I'm sure all of you are aware. Uh, labs will be either Mondays at 5 or at 6 p.m., depending on what, where we can get a room. We're trying to get the labs down uh, in, in the Warnock Engineering Building instead of here. Or anywhere here so that it's like a little bit easier for people who spend a lot of time there yeah no uh nothing here is mandatory right uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no the labs will help you like if you basically what i'm telling you is if you go to the labs the homework will be like twice as easy <laughs> so there will be very like explicit hints about how to solve the homework uh i have lots of questions here um maybe let me uh, go on a little bit, and if you still have the questions at the end, I'm happy to take them, right? Maybe I'm answering some of your questions uh, as I have the next couple of slides, okay? Um, I am trying to record these lectures. Um, I think, well, there's the website here um, that is kind of like your source of information for everything. They, it has instructions about the project. It has the syllabus, which you should read. Um, and um, it has the schedule. It's like a Google Calendar that, can, that you can add to your calendar, and then you have an overview of all the homeworks. This also will be available in Canvas. Um, one thing that we do maybe slightly differently from other classes that you've taken in the School of Computing, I hate Canvas messages, uh, and I hate Canvas discussion forums. I love Slack. And so we'll be using a Slack team to communicate in this class. Um, that's kind of the main way for, for us to announce stuff, uh, for you to get help, in addition to office hours, of course. The one thing I, I would I like to ask you, please try to limit personal messages. This is like a big class. It's the biggest it's ever been. It's more than 170 students. Um, and you might have a question. Many other people might have the same question, right? If you post it in a general channel, um, it's going to help us manage our workload. And it manages, like, and somebody else can also help. And so that would be great. Um, we'll use Canvas for grading, for assignment submissions, and so on. All of the assignment deadlines will be, also be in Canvas. Um, and then we have office hours. My office hours are always Tuesdays from four to five in my office in the Warnock Engineering Building, third floor. Um, and um, I'm gonna do them mostly in person, but if you wanna meet on Zoom, I can make an arrangement and I can send you a link to Slack me. Um, and then our TAs will also have office hours. And like, basically you should come to my office hours if you have something to discuss about the lecture content or if something administrative is going on. Um, welcome to ask me also about D3. But mostly you should ask the TAs about like your homework and D3 and so on. And they'll be holding office hours spread out over the week. They will be partially online. They will be partially in person. We'll announce a room for that. Um, and they will start next week as we have the first homework coming up. Um, you can email me um, at alex at sci.utah.edu. You have to email me from a University of Utah email address. I'm not going to respond if you, if you send me an email from your personal Gmail. Uh, that's just a new policy that we have university-wide. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm trying to record this, um, but you think of this as kind of like a stopgap. Like if, if somebody here gets COVID, um, I'm trying to make it possible for you to participate if you have to quarantine or if you have to travel because you're like some family emergency or anything like that. 
I'm trying to record this lecture, but I'm gonna make sure that the in-class experience is great. And I'm not gonna like, like I'm not gonna be able to pay too much attention to how the online experience, sorry. Like I would need a professional staff here with a camera and like a moderator and so on to make both of those things really work. Um, and so it's gonna be like, you know, you'll get the theory, I guess, when I'm lecturing, but I'm not gonna be on camera because I walk around, right, uh, all the time and so on. So in-person experience is gonna be much better. I'm not gonna like the activities will not be possible to do online. Um, like, so when we ever have an activity, that might be like 30 or 40% of a class, right? Uh, you, this will be like an in-class experience only, and you won't be able to do the activity and hand it in for credit um, if you're online. Um, this should supposed to be on a YouTube channel, but there was like some hiccup with my uh, Zoom configuration that I wasn't able to fix without help from the administration. Um, there's two required books, but you don't have to buy them. They're available for free um, through the uh, uh, university. Um, if you're on campus, you can access them. There's a link in the syllabus. Um, we'll be learning how to do web development. So we'll learn about JS, about uh, like HTML and CSS. Um, we will use a mostly a library that's called D3. Um, that's kind of like a great library to do data visualization, but as bonus content and probably not mandatory or not part of any homework, like some of our TAs are also this PhD students and they're very excited about things like Vue and React. Um, and so there will be like a lecture on how to do like real data visualization as the cool kids now do it uh, with Vue and React. But I don't wanna like, you know, these things are complicated. There's a lot of like things that come with it. So I don't wanna force anybody to do that. But there will be like one lecture on, on probably React, how you do data visualization with React. Um, in terms of prerequisites, I expect everybody here knows how to program, right? This is like a computer science graduate class. Um, if you know C, C++, Java, or Python, you should be fine. Of course, if you know web development, you, you're gonna be, have an easier time. Your time, uh, you, you'll spend less time on your homeworks. The other thing that is maybe uncommon, especially for people with a classical CS degree is that this is like an HCI adjacent class, right? We'll talk a lot about squishy things like humans. Um, and so I need everybody here who wants to take this class to be willing to engage with that, right? Um, we will be doing design. We'll be thinking about user-centered design. We're thinking about perception. We're thinking about like human visual systems and we're thinking about like uh, evaluations uh, with humans and, and things like that, right? Um, and you also have to have a willingness to learn new software and tools. Like I'm not gonna, like I'm gonna give you like the crash course in JavaScript in a single lecture, right? But uh, that's not gonna, be enough if you if you like don't engage with these tools yourself. So you would need you will need to be able uh, and willing to kind of like you know take what we give you. We'll try to guide you, but it's not going to be like a freshman course where we're going to like you know show the, exactly here's the uh, assignment, here's the solution, and we go through every line of code. Um, some formalities, and this is the boring part. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, well, this is maybe the least boring part for many of you. How are you graded? Um, so we'll have five to six homework assignments. Currently, we're planning on six. Um, these will be 35% of your grade. They will vary in value uh, between 2% and 10%, depending on the length and the difficulty. And we'll let you know ahead of time um, which of them are worth how much. Um, one recommendation we have, which probably every teacher always says, start early with the homeworks. Um, some might struggle a little bit with D3 and, and the webs at the beginning. And if you start early, you have an opportunity to get help, to go to office hours, to ask questions. Um, if you do this on Friday night, uh, like we, we essentially try to keep regular business hours. And so we might respond at 6 p.m., but we're not promising that we'll be like around the 10 p.m. Uh, on the day of the deadline. The big chunk um, of your grade is gonna be your final project. Um, so that's 40% of your grade, and that's split up uh, between the proposal and two milestones um, that will be in teams. And there will be two relatively low value exams, but they will still be 20% of your grade. So there will be one the last day before fall break and the one the last day before classes end. They will be in class on paper. Um, and there will be like, uh, well, I'll talk about the exams in some more detail later. And then we have 5% for these in class activities that are also sometimes in the group. Um, we do have a code of conduct in the School of Computing, but also in this class. Um, we're committed to providing an inclusive and harassment free environment in all interactions, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, race, or religion. We do not tolerate harassment in any form. 
And if you experience any harassment or inappropriate behavior, please report it either to me uh, or to any uh, instance on campus, like the Dean of Students, or if you feel uh, like unsafe, go to safeu.utah.edu. Um, there's also the syllabus, as I mentioned, please, um, it especially like, you know, the, the policies for homeworks and so on is explained on there. Uh, make, sure, make sure you read that. Um, and there's also the student code of conduct um, that goes into more details. Unfortunately, uh, cheating is like the bane of the existence of every computer science professor. Uh, it all happens every year. We catch some people copying code either from uh, their peers in this class or maybe from some other source. Um, and I want to be clear that we do not tolerate any plagiarism in this class. Um, it's still a team-based project, for example, and you're also welcome to discuss in the abstract and homework assignments with your peers. So you're like welcome to work in teams and have study groups as long as you don't like copy text from each other, you'll be in the clear, right? Um, but here's the formal policy. Um, you may not submit the same or similar work to this course that you've submitted or will submit to another, uh, nor may you provide or make solutions available to uh, solutions to homeworks available to individuals who have make this, may take this course in the future. You must, the work that you turn in must be your own. You must write your own code. You must design your own visualization. You must critically evaluate the results in your own words. Um, the School of Computing has a misconduct policy that applies to everybody independent in this course, independent of whether you like a School of Computing student or you're in some other department as your like major. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, the, um, I've gotten back here. Um, I still have 10 minutes. Um, well, uh, the policy of the School of Computing is mostly like if we catch you cheating, you will A, fail the class and B, a strike will be recorded. And what this means, like if you have one strike, you will never be able to TA again. Um, and if you get two strikes, you'll be dismissed from the program. Um, and uh, this is especially like, I, I don't think I have to say this, but like a PhD student should never be caught cheating, right? Because this might be, get you into some like crazy situation because actually as part of your curriculum requirement, you have to TA, TM, and suddenly we are not allowed to let you TM anymore, right? And so that's gonna be like a very, very unpleasant situation. But if you're a PhD student, this shouldn't even matter, right? Um, note that we will automatically check all submissions for, and we compare the previous solutions to sources on the internet, and we'll check against each other's solutions. There's really good tools like this. Um, you can check them out. For example, Stanford's MOS tool uh, that allows us to do this um, more or less automatically. It's easy to catch, um, and I would recommend do a cost-benefit analysis if you're thinking about copying somebody's code, right? Losing points on the homework is a minor nuisance, especially in this class where homeworks in total aren't that important, right? Uh, and like you might fail the class, you might, might lose the money that you put into tuition, you might not be able to continue the program. Um, so the five points that you might like scrape together for homework is certainly not worth it, right? Uh, and as I said, tools like Moss make it easy to catch cheating. Um, if you have cheated in the past and you weren't caught, it's most likely that somebody didn't check, right? Um, because checking is an effort, um, but it's easy to actually catch people. So um, more pleasant things. Um, this week, uh, we have homework zero due. Homework zero is really just an introductory homework. It's not graded. It basically asks you to sign up for Slack, to answer a short survey. Um, and, th and so on. Um, you should be like reading the D3 book chapters one to three and the textbook by Tamara Munsner, BDA, Visual Data Analysis and Design, um, chapter one of that. Um, you can find those in the syllabus. Um, next week, we'll have homework one due. Uh, the lecture on Thursday is going to be about perception. And then next week, we'll be starting with like an introduction to some of the basic tools we need. Uh, we'll I'll do like a brief Git introduction, HTML, CSS introduction, and then our TAs will start having their office hours. Um, the homeworks will be published um, on, the, on GitHub. Um, so you, you submit them on Canvas, but they will be published on GitHub. You can download them or you can clone the repository. There's instructions in the README. Um, I think it's useful for everybody here to have these skills to work a little bit with GitHub. And most of you probably have already worked with that. So um, that's it. I'm happy to take questions now, uh, either like in the, yeah. We plan on recording in the labs, yes.
Well, uh, you don't have to be in person. We're going to record them, and they're not mandatory, right? They're just helpful. You can the final project you can because that's your work, but you can't do that with the homeworks. Okay. Well, if you have more questions, I'll be here for another 10 minutes or I have office hours. Thank you everybody for coming and I'm looking forward to the semester. So I'm really interested in this course. I'm also looking at my fall course and I yep. got a lot going on. I was wondering, do you know when the next time you plan to teach this course is? Um, well, it will be taught again next fall. It'll be in the fall. Yeah. 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 Hey. I'm not going to know this course. Uh, it depends a little bit. Uh, generally, it's full um, for grad students. So. You should send me an email already. Um, so I'm basically making exceptions for people who need this course this semester. Um, but I, as you would have to monitor, like some people might drop, right? And then uh, might open up. So, so the, yeah. Yeah, then you just have to do to, to kind of like look uh, when a spot opens up, you can register. Yeah, <laughs> I can't make like a trade here. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Hey. Hey, Shaya. Um, and I'm a new middle student. Okay. Great. And last day I chose Professor Faye Wong Phillips uh, yeah. as my rotation advisor. Yeah, great. So she uh, gave me to research oh, yeah. for the class this semester. Yeah. The tech one New York class is closed now. Okay. So I need your permission to go to this class. So um, send me an email. Okay. And I'll see what I can do. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Hey, uh, I liked your introduction. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up uh, Mother of All Demos. It's always <laughs> like this weird thing where a lot of it is like better than what we have today. Yeah, and I guess I could just look it up. But I was curious about that like the video of that, for example, on camera, like that looks a lot better than like Zoom, for example. Is that because they have like a more secure connection? Or I think this was just like. Um, done really well in terms of editing right like one thing that you noticed that um like you noticed how he asked this other guy with the mouse from middle of park there was like a big lag right uh, so i think that it's basically you know if you if we were to like record the best of what i do on zoom uh it, it would look pretty good yeah okay all right well i'm just curious but i but i think that there was like a lot of really amazing stuff happening back oh, yeah. then and very visionary oh yeah big time yeah uh, well uh, it was nice to meet you here. yeah same here I'm sure you won't be right now, but I just thought it made sense to meet you. Have a good day. You too. Hey. I'm Alan Weber. I emailed hey, you from uh, Lovar. Yes. yes. I'm the, the senior guy that was in the Silicon Effort Manufacturing business. Yes. So I remember. I a full time job doing uh, yeah. uh, communication control, data visualization, yeah. Yeah. manufacturing. Cool. So just wanted to say it looks like it's going to be great. Uh, nice. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Incredibly humane. Okay, yeah. But, uh, I'm still, uh, oh, like I said, still dealing with how navigate the whole uh, yeah. PhD process. Apparently. Let us know if you need any help. Um, okay. We're happy to um, help out wherever we can. Okay. Thanks for the Yep. Hey. Uh, I'm Frank Vishnay from the Indian University of the Department of Education. Yes. So I attended your class. Yes. Uh, I see you in the kitchen and uh, I think it's very complex. Yeah, yeah. So certain business courses. Yeah. 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 Let me take a look. Excuse me.